So uh, this session together will be uh, diving into place-based approaches and looking at examples from Australia and the UK. And in particular, of course, we are focusing on how you evaluate them. So not just in general. Um, so let me begin by introducing my panelists. I'm really excited. I've never met Lily. I've never met you before. So I'm really pleased to meet you. You are a place-based uh, and partnership learning expert and principal consultant at Renacy. So I'd love to know a bit about you. I don't even know what Renacy is. I'm here in Australia. I don't know anything. So give us, tell us a little bit about you and who you work for and what you do. Sure, thanks, Jess. So uh, yeah, I, I'm Lily. I'm a principal consultant at Renacy and we're based in the UK. Um, so Renacy is a social enterprise. I don't know if that model transcends beyond the UK, but um, we are a business that pours our profit back into social causes, basically. And Renacy specifically focuses on place-based uh, solutions to socio-economic exclusion. Um, and we do that for a number of ways. Um, so we help people get into work uh, through employment services. We deliver place-based systems change projects. And what I do is um, provide part of our consultancy is that we deliver evaluations and learning partnerships for funders and charities doing place-based work. So I head up uh, that part of Fantastic. the organization. Well, great to meet you. And I can't wait to hear about your examples. And then we also, from Clear Horizon, we have Elise and Farakia. So I'll start with you. Elise, tell us a bit about you. Where do you call home? Um, and you know, what's your, what's your interaction with place-based approaches? Thank you, Jess. Well, I live and work on Dakunjung country on the beautiful central coast of New South Wales in Australia. And um, just extending my respects to the traditional owners of Dakunjung country, where I'm calling from. And I grew up in um, Darug country on a uh, sort of west of Sydney, um, but I've been up here for about 17 years. So um, I'm very lucky because we're spoilt for natural environment and waterways. It's quite a beautiful place and community. So my background is in project design, delivery and evaluation across different sectors. And I've been very fortunate to be at Clear Horizon for four and a half years. And so I am a lead principal consultant in the social impact team. And my focus area is on this challenge of evaluating systems change and place-based approaches. And that's the portfolio of work that I specialize in. And I'm really, um, really appreciate that I get to work with the inspired and very relentless change makers who are working on um, some really big social and environmental issues um, and working out how to navigate their way through measurement, evaluation and learning in this space. Fantastic. Thank you, Elise. And uh, Frankia, let's hear a bit about you. Maybe I know that for those of you who don't know, Frankia, she works a lot at the community level. So maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, thank you, Jess. Um, so yes, I work at Clear Horizon as well as a senior consultant. But prior to kind of delving into the evaluation world, I've been mainly working um, in social change work, leading social change initiatives. And I guess my first place-based initiatives that I led was in the, in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam in, in 2010, which was called the Connected Neighbourhood. And the aim was to um, increase our social cohesion in those areas. And that was really the first time that I sort of did this work and a lot of trial and error, didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, but we, yeah, we created some amazing outcomes with local residents and lots of different um, organisations. And then, um, yeah, moving to Australia, Australia, I worked for a place um, called Together SA, um, and they were doing um, collective impact uh, initiatives. So I was the backbone lead for an initiative in Adelaide, which was focusing on young people and their well-being. And then, uh, yeah, just before um, joining Clear Horizon, I worked um, in Gallywinkle, which is an island uh, about um, 500 kilometers off the coast of um, it's it's off the coast of um, Northeast Arnhem Land, and it's 500 kilometers from Darwin. It's a Yungu community. So I was leading, co-leading a place-based initiative there with the young leaders. So yeah, I've been doing a lot of social change work and I think evaluation is so important because this is new work and it, it's an emerging um, you know, field. And in order kind of for it to grow and prosper, we need to evaluate and learn from what we're doing um, for it to become bigger, brighter and better. Please. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we're gonna have a good session with you guys. 
So I'm going to ask Elise to begin um, by look, just getting in really simple terms, if you can. Could you explain to us um, systems change, place-based approaches, why they're different than a program, and why and what that what challenges that presents to us as evaluators? Sure. All right. I'll start with systems change because place-based approaches is a type of systems change approach that occurs in a geographic location. So systems change initiatives attempt to um, shift the conditions that might hold societal or environmental issues in place. And so it's trying to take a holistic view and it's trying to um, take into account the policies, the practices, the social norms, the power relations, um, how people think and act um, across the systems um, that will affect how um, effective transformative change might be. And so what I can say, because it's quite difficult to explain, they're usually non-programmatic interventions or initiatives. They're usually complex in nature, long-term and emergent. And so when we're talking about uh, place-based, we're talking about initiatives that really take place into account. So people use that term for different types of applications. So one of the, um, ideally it's sort of characterized by partnering and shared design at the local level and definitely informed by place and people of the area that it's in and um, there's you know at one end of the continuum there's really community-led types of initiatives where they're leading you know the accountability and design for the types of outcomes that are going to suit them in context but it has a big focus on having place and context and people at the center of um, solutions. So okay. in terms of challenges, because it's not programmatic, um, what we're dealing with as evaluators is a bit of slippery territory and there, there's the complexity and this sort of non-linear behaviour of how outcomes happen and the sort of causal chain of events. So I think it requires us to reframe how we think about results and what's in focus and what's important, particularly in the shorter and medium term. And so as well as like keeping our eye on the high level changes that we're trying to create for say if it's community outcomes or well-being, we also need to look at how are the conditions for the change, how are the ways of working affecting the change, what are the types of systemic changes that are happening along the way. So there's a lot more to these sort of middle level outcomes that come into play and um, are part of the challenge that we're trying to navigate when we're evaluating this space. a hard thing to say in in such a short period of time thank you Elise so they're not programs they go across multiple uh, programs often don't they and they center on people so Lily I might come over to you now so I believe that you um you've you've taken the place-based evaluation course which was developed in Australia of course uh, was co-designed in Australia of the framework and so I'd be, I'm so curious to see how that resonated with you over in in uh, in the UK yeah great yeah it was um it, it was a really great course and it taught me so much actually we use a lot of the frameworks and, and tools in our, our place-based work in the UK um and I think I, actually at least what you've just said resonated with me the most from that course was the time it takes to reach the end outcome. And we knew that as, as organizations that evaluate place-based work, but it was kind of actually telling funders there's a way to measure the progress and the kind of the, the, the development towards the change that you're trying to create and that being evidence in itself and that being a kind of a positive demonstration of how the program's working. I think that was a real light bulb moment actually from the course. Um, and we've taken three key principles actually into our place-based evaluations from that course. And the first one is about always being participatory and inclusive. So bringing in those most affected to help with the design of the evaluation as well, so that it's relevant for them um, and the communication of findings makes sense to them. And they have responsibility and ownership for the evaluation as well as the project delivery. So we get them in to kind of help define the outcomes and 
think about what they're going to do to prove them as well as kind of who's going to take responsibility for all of that. Um, the second principle we've taken into our, our work, which, you know, we were doing anyway, but this course really helped to solidify that was around being theory driven. So as we've mentioned, place based programs have multiple partners and the potential for multiple interventions. And at the outset, you just don't know what's going to happen or, or how people are going to work together or decide to to kind of create change. So it's essential to develop a theory around how how that is going to happen to reach the desired vision and understand who's contributing to it, what role they're playing um, and how they're going to support change to come about. So, um, yeah, developing a testable theory. Um, and that moves us on to our third principle, which is around being flexible and iterative and knowing that your theory is going to change. Um, and so we often used phased evaluation approaches, which is something that came out of the course, which is, you know, developing something broad at the outset and honing that as you go through. So year on year throughout your place based programs, you're understanding what you've learned so far, what's worked well, what outcomes you've achieved what change looks like in the future, you know, what, what relationships have now been built that means a whole new way of working or a whole new outcome or vision for change is, is now possible. So having a live theory of change and a flexible approach that allows you to get there has, has been really useful. Fantastic. And I, I would love to, it's great to hear how you've used it and to, to imagine that this stuff is, is is happening right across the planet. We thought we'd go and get a bit concrete now and hear a case study. Now we are running a little bit behind because we've all got a lot to say. So I'd ask you, Fraukia, to be fairly brief in your case study, if that's okay. But let's let's do this because it's really important to get real, isn't it? And I'm sure the audience want to hear. So as as um, Fraukia, if we could share, are you sharing some slides? No, uh, I don't have slides, but I will be okay. talking about Hands of Mali. Um, okay, fantastic. Maybe I should have uh, maybe I should have brought no, no. slides. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's absolutely fine. It's lovely. Go for it. So Prakki is going to talk about a case study from Australia, which is a collective impact called Hands Up Mali that we have the joy of working with. And again, I'd say to the audience, please type your questions in as you go in the in the chat thing, even if we don't get to answer them all, we will we'll put we'll put the question the answers out afterwards. So over to yeah. you, Prakki. No worries. So yeah, so Elise and I have been working with Hands of Mali and they're a regional community in Victoria uh, and they have a collaboration which is like obviously place based um, and their community aspiration is um, a connected community where families matter and children thrive. So in order to help that collaboration do the measurement, evaluation and learning, we've been working side by side them to develop their overarching measurement, evaluation and learning framework. So that was very participatory. Um, participants from lots of different organizations were a part of that. And basically as part of that journey, like what Lily talked about previously, the importance of having that fear of change, how do you expect change is gonna happen? We co-designed that together with the participants. Um, and then at the same time, we also co-designed the key evaluation questions. So when you look at that whole initiative, um, like what are the questions that we need to answer in order to know that we're currently here and we're working on this 10, 15, 20 year change initiative, like what are the steps we need, what are the signs of change we need to see along the way. So in addition to that, like obviously they're, they're a big initiative, they focus on zero to 25 year olds, so they've asked us to work with them to um, create nested um, male plans. So we're in the process of finalizing the first one, which is focusing on zero to eight year olds. So we've done a similar process where we developed the theory of change, but we had actual um, families in the room that um, were participating and that kids kind of playing on the side. So it is very, it, it's not it's, it's not a top-down way of working. It's really those people that are affected by the challenges in the community, they're part of the process of, of creating um, um, everything that's part of the initiative, including including Mel. Uh, and I'm currently also working with them to um, to develop a nested Mel for their nine to 18 year olds. And there are gonna be lots of young people involved in that. And then in addition to all of that, we're also involved in uh, evaluating pieces of work they're currently working on or they're finalized. So one evaluation that I just finished is um, an active outreach evaluation where they um, they developed a, an approach to um, deal with high COVID numbers in the community. 
Um, and yeah, I think what's different with the, this evaluation to, I guess, regular evaluation is that once again, it was very participatory. So different people were involved in co-designing um, the key evaluation questions uh, were like. I think really important as well in this context is like use of language um, because community is involved and the methods you use. So it's, it's really around you're in a particular place. So the way how you work, you really need to uh, align that with your place. You can't just kind of, yeah, plunk random methods in there. You really need to be aware of kind of what that place is, is um, like. Uh, and I think what's what's different, and also with the data collection is, is really understanding kind of like what are the needs. So we are not based in Mildura, but because there were lots of community members involved, I, I went there myself and I sat in the front yard with Aboriginal, um, community members. I, um, I went to one of the organizations in town where I interviewed uh, a Thai farmer with a, with a translator, um, but really doing that in a way that kind of yeah, matches that place. And I think um, what's, what's important there as well is like then when you kind of like analyze the findings, we do joint sense making. So actually inviting people from that place and that's, that's members from different organizations, but also community members to be involved in actually like Understand like what what is the data telling us and and doing that joint sense making and analysis so that is not just you as an evaluator that's kind of like interpreting the data but it's actually that community and I think what's really um like I'll, I'll finish now but I think what's really awesome is that in addition to the report we wrote Hands of Mali themselves have um, created a video uh, which actually kind of like explains the findings of the evaluation. And maybe one more thing to mention is that really important, and Elise kind of emphasized it as well, is the importance also of process. So you're not just looking at the outcomes, it's a long-term journey. So you're really looking also at like, how are we getting to those outcomes? So are we working well together? Are we sharing data? Uh, are we co-designing? And what is the impact of doing those things on the outcomes you're achieving? Thanks so much. Uh, that's a really tangible example. And for the audience there, it's important to note. So when Kate talked about developmental evaluation, she was talking about something that was right at the start. So Frauke is talking about an initiative that's been going for quite some time, hasn't it? How long has Hands Up Mali been going for? Uh, I'm not really sure, but I know that when I was still working in Adelaide in 2018, like they were already, they were already in existence. But I think they've kind of like a when they just started, you know, it was the uh, collective impact just started in Australia. So I think they've changed quite a bit. Um, but yeah, now they, yeah. Now well, it must be five or six. Do you know, yeah. Elise? Um, yeah, probably about five years. Five years. So it's more of a mid stage. So you can see the sort of work, the data, there's more data. Frankie is talking about da using data and wrapping evaluation around things, and uh, but still focusing on those sort of core enablers. So I'm, I'm slightly changing what we planned, by the way, just for the panelists. So I thought we might just open up to all of you to sort of share some of your key learnings and, and maybe just start with Lily. I mean, you've heard that example. How does that compare to some of the learnings that you're having in uh, Empowered Places initiatives that you've been working on? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it really resonates, actually. We're doing, I think, some of the stuff you're doing around um, using the community and part of the sense making is something that's been so useful for us as well. Um, and also kind of understanding that learning's happening at so many different um, or outcomes are happening yeah. at so many different levels has been um, a really important finding for us and that cha the kind of emergent change is leading to more change and um, it's quite hard to measure that on an ongoing basis so you need a framework that allows you to kind of continue to do that um, as you're going and to kind of to understand new and emergent outcomes and um, yeah so it's quite a lot of similarities in, in the process that Frankie was was talking about. Fantastic. And I guess like, um, I'm going to sort of hit you with the challenges now. So what do you think? Uh, it sounds like we've got it all stitched up, but <clears throat> I don't think we have, do we? You know, for those of you who are listening in, we might be sounding like we've made a start at evaluating this sort of work. But in my experience, we're actually really all on a massive learning journey. Everybody, if anybody tells you you've got it nailed, don't believe them, you know, because this is an emerging space. So given that, Elise, what do you think are the next things we need to work on? What, what do you think we need to? 
they are. I sort of see this in three buckets of challenges as an evaluator. I think there's the managing <laughs> expectations. Nicely, that's nicely compartmentalised there. That's what we do, isn't <laughs> I know, it? I know, I know, I <laughs> know. It's so neat. Um, so there's the managing expectations about this long-term slippery journey that the initiative's on and using Mel to be able to do that. So using things like um, Lily mentioned of the theory of change model that can help um, step out the phases and that can really help bring people around to the idea of the nature of the work and um, how it's going to unfold over time. And then there is the cultural aspect, which is equally as important as the technical aspect of measurement evaluation and learning. And so that is having a safe culture of learning where that's quite different it's a different way of working because often people from organisations are in competitive funding environments, it's not safe to share things that aren't working, they're not encouraged to do that because it's often linked to funding and so what is required to do adaptive leadership work and this type of change work is to be able to turn up share the learnings and to admit what you just said Jess is that you are a subject yeah. matter expert and you also don't know all the answers of how and to it's do a this. little bit the opposite of what evaluators are a bit like isn't it like we tend to be nerdy experts who have got all the data but actually yeah. we have to show up as learners as well don't we yeah um, and then everybody the does and then the third bucket is the technical. And so, you know, just over the years, trying to refine the toolkit of, um, you know, how you show up and the principles that you follow, as well as the tools and the methods and that technical act, 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 uh, sorry, aspect of the work. Um, but one thing that I trip up on all the time, I'm still learning how to do, is how to present this in really simple ways that, you know, don't trip people up because it's full of jargon. We're like jargon machines in this space. We are jargon machines. That's so Can true. I add something to that, Jess? Yeah, as well? please do. Yeah. So I think also a challenge in this work is is contribution versus attribution. Oh like yeah, I was going to ask running... that. You're ahead of me. Go for yeah, it, please. When yeah. you're running a project or a program, you can say like, oh, because of a program, this happened to the participants. But when you're running like a place-based systems change initiative, you have all these different partners working together on very high-level goals. So it's kind of like, mm -hmm. and that's something that people often feel uncomfortable with because it's like what what was a role in achieving that and and often like when you're working on things like there might be other organizations that are doing work on the same goal at the same time so figuring out like what yeah what role did we play in achieving those changes I think that's a challenge as well mm, that's so true so that's this this idea of contribution and people you can't it's almost it requires you to be a bit humble doesn't it that you can't have all the impact it's not your impact necessary especially if you're an intermediary or a you know a backbone organization these are the language that people use yeah yeah definitely um i've got a few questions now from uh the the things that were sent in beforehand so we can we can work out who's going to answer them hey and there's some questions up on the board as well so Please, uh, audience, feel free. That's a great time to add your questions into the Q&A because we're answering some of them live. So um, I don't know, uh, maybe even Frauke, you can have a go at this, but um, First Nations and Indigenous evaluation approaches and methods. What can mainstream evaluators or maybe why non-Indigenous evaluators learn from Indigenous and First Nations methods? Thank you, Jess. So yeah, so like I mentioned before, I worked for two years in an Aboriginal community. And it, it's, I, I think kind of when you go to places like that, but also when you, I, I guess, are not in an Indigenous community, but you have Indigenous people involved, like you need to understand that there are different ways of seeing the world. And uh, also with systems change, you know, you have, you have like, we think about leverage points and conditions for systems change, but then there's also Aboriginal views on that as well. So I think it's really like when you go into a context like that, it's you need to learn and listen to each other. And I think a big difference is that like in Aboriginal views to evaluation, it's really about the process and how you get there. And I think uh, non-Aboriginal people are very, you know, we want things to happen quickly. We want things to happen now. We want to be focused on the outcome. Whereas I think, um, from my experience working with young people, they're much more involved in the process. And like, are we getting there? Are the steps sort of following kind of the journey and we're on the right track because, but we want to know like, oh, are we on, are we on that track? Like, 
tomorrow have we achieved our goals so I think that's sounds like what we all need to learn I mean like it sounds like that what, what, what Kate was talking about with developmental evaluation they need to slow down and and like be more relational and focus on on the process and and the building blocks rather than being always obsessed yeah, yeah. with the impact yeah. and I think also what's important as well as things like language it's it's like even if we have the same understanding about things, if we use language that people are not familiar with or the other way around when people are talking about Aboriginal concepts. So it's really about creating that joint understanding. And yeah, when, when I was working in Gallywinkle, we built um, metaphors. So we were using a collective impact approach and we actually built a hunting and gathering story that ex explains that approach from a young um, worldview but it's actually talking about the different conditions of collective impact. So sharing data and mutually reinforcing activities, having a backbone. Uh, but yeah, so it's bringing like the Aboriginal people and the non-Aboriginal people working that space together and having that joint understanding. Um, it, it, it's not easy, but it is, it's, re it's really important. And I mean, I've learned so much and I think, yeah, uh, it really uh, enriched my practice. I've got a question from the q and going to have a crack at it. So in the examples that we've shared, so Lily, uh, Elise and Farakia, um, of place-based, and um, how do you bridge the gap between lived experience and technical expertise um, in those evaluations? So there you go. I'm Anybody want to have a crack? To. Yeah. Uh, I'll jump in uh, quickly. But um, yeah, so how we've done that in some of our evaluations is by using community researchers. So we've trained up people in the community and um, taught them how to, you know, ask good questions, how to get people to open up, how to then interpret that data um, and analyze it. And so we feel that by using community researchers, we've been able to reach a whole load more people than we would have been able to otherwise. And especially if we had the technical, uh, you know, a, a, an evaluator, typical evaluator going into communities where they didn't have share any of the same kind of, um, you know, demographics or anything as the people that were living there or any of the same issues. Um, and that's been really useful. And it's been, it's meant we've had so much more honest research because people have been able to open up to their peers and it's also helped kind of bring people into the process and feel that they're um, leading it or taking some responsibility for it as well so I think there can be a balance in in doing that approach. We use MSC at Most Significant Change quite a lot uh, as because not novices adequately trained novices can do it. Do you want to comment on that Elise and how that's interplaced with your work? Um, well, I think that story based approaches like my significant change technique are really good at being open ended and encouraging people to talk about what change matters in their own words, um, from their own points of view and lived experience. For some of the partnerships that I've worked on, um, having the um, having it valued that there's different knowledges and you know, different types of evidence is going to count from the beginning is really important so that lived experience, local cultural knowledge can sit alongside research and, um, you know, publicly available data and that that lived experience comes in really early. So from, you know, community conversations to most significant change techniques, all of those sort of open ended story um, narrative techniques are really good. And then um, I think you also have to approach it so it might not get to consensus. So sometimes there are going to be different perspectives from different um, evidence sources, knowledge sources that um, are going to sit beside each other and, you know, be at odds or have tension and then it can't all be resolved sometimes into one truth. And so you have to work out ways to be able to sit that beside each other, you know, while still being rigorous and still um, meeting the expectations of what evaluation has to deliver. But I think it's different to that, you know, conventional view of the findings that you get from program evaluation. Well, guys, the time is up for um, this session number two. So um, shortly we'll move into the third session with Penny and Zazie. But before we do that, I just want to say if anybody's interested in learning more about 
evaluating place-based approaches, bearing in mind that we're all still learning. A couple of resources, there's the, there's the guide, which is free. You can access it. Maybe somebody could pop a link to it in the chat, but that um, was, was um, on the web. But there's also our training, if people are interested in going along to that, which is based on, on, the, on the framework. Um, which is evaluating systems change one. And again, if you're interested or you know anybody who's interested, if you use that link, you get a discount. <laughs>